questions. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to have uh, Yal Lehi, you are the first uh, presenter, um, and then followed by uh, Professor Chen. Okay, let's, uh, if you have any uh, further comments, uh, we can discuss it. Uh, if uh, there are no further comments, then uh, Lehi, uh, could you uh, start your presentation? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Park, uh, and thank you to the uh, mm. to the German team for for organizing this and hosting us. Uh, I hope you have received the paper. It was sent a bit late, but um, mm. uh, I I think I had sent it maybe a few days ago. So I hope you will have time to go through it. As you said, we will have a short presentation. I will I will not read out my draft uh, paper. Um, then I also want before to before I start just again to apologize that because of my teaching commitments I will have to leave after session one and will not be able to participate in the in the session two and also the administrative uh, discussions about our project so please forgive me uh, for 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 not being able to be uh, involved in this so um, my paper is on I hope that's okay, if I can start. Yes, yes, please. Okay, so my paper is on the EU and the geopolitics of connectivity. Basically, I'm trying to determine uh, what's the EU's role and how the EU in, uh, in some ways actually already a geopolitical actor when it comes to the connectivity agenda. So I started uh, the paper by, by uh, saying that you know, con connectivity has become a buzzword uh, only in the last decade or so uh, because of the fact that globalization is now, the word globalization is now such a loaded uh, 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 term. And of course, because of the backlash against globalization, the increasing uh, unhappiness and, and the association of globalization with the increasing inequalities, blah, blah, blah. So connectivity becomes a term that connotes this idea that is about you know, physical connectivity, building pipelines and road and transport, and is therefore not associated with this neoliberal uh, agenda in that sense. So it has become such a buzzword that everybody now is using it. We have, like I said, ASEAN has rolled out its first master plan on connectivity in 2010. You have APEC also with its master plan or, or its uh, uh, declaration to achieve connectivity to the four pillars, blah, blah, blah. So all this uh, is just a, a quick introduction onto how this connectivity term uh, comes to become such a buzzword. Then the next portion of my paper basically is to look at EU's uh, strategy towards Asia and how the ASEM platform has actually been a good forum for the EU in exercising some of its so-called in actually building its foreign policy identity and exercising some sort of a, um, uh, agency over the uh, over over the agenda and 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 and, and particularly in this case uh, as as it develops into the uh, connectivity agenda. So I started off in this uh, section by looking at of course the 1994 uh, the first the very first Asia strategy that the EU released uh, towards a new Asia strategy. And, 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 and then from there, from you know, going through the whole development of its Asian strategy and coming to the point that ASEM is actually to me a, a very much geo-economic response of uh, the EU towards the, from, towards the, the APEC. So already when, they, when ASEM was conceived, of course, ASEM was not conceived by the Europeans per se. It was an idea that was uh, brought up first by, by the Singapore Prime Minister. But the very fact that they could latch on quickly to this idea and, and that within less than two years, uh, the first summit was held in Bangkok, uh, showed that the EU in some way saw the opportunity for them uh, to have this dual economic tool uh, as a response uh, to, to APEC and, and the whole APEC vision of having a uh, free trade area of the Asia Pacific by 2020, 
of 2010 at that time was the vision. So I went through a sort of a, a, a draft to, to look into how the Asian strategy of the EU has developed. And of course, we know that when the EU talk about Asia strategy towards uh, uh, the, from, from 1994 to 2006, in reality, there was a lot of a perception at that time that uh, the EU Asia strategy is mainly about China, right? So you see after the first Asian strategy paper, you have uh, the EU releasing a, a whole series of paper or strategy paper towards uh, China from 95, the first one in 95, and then 98, 2001, 2003, 2006. And of course, you could again then already see that concern over the, you can say it's both a uh, uh, sense of the challenge that the, the, the China, uh, or the opportunities that China uh, presents uh, with its opening to the, to the world economy. But at the same time, uh, to see that there's, of course, the whole idea of how the EU should react to a, a rising China. Um, 2012 turned out to be the year uh, of, uh, that the EU really uh, moved beyond China to look broadly into, into Asia, into more, to, to really uh, focus more broadly on the whole Asia Pacific. And this uh, came about because I think of the EU's, of the Obama's at that time announcement of this pivot uh, to Asia. And the EU again sort of responds to this by also have its own pivot uh, to Asia. And so you see a lot of high level visits in, uh, from 2012, not to just to China, but really to Southeast Asia and, and, and this talk about raising the engagement with other uh, Asian partners uh, besides China. And of course, we also see that the, the, the geopolitical uh, situation started to change in the Asia Pacific as China began a much more assertive uh, uh, foreign policy approach uh, after 2013 in particular. And, and, uh, and especially with the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative. So this, in some way, of course, lead the, the, the EU to, to have a China paper in 2016, uh, which has a very different tone from the very first five papers that was uh, released a decade ago, uh, talking about the need to reaccess and reaffirm the principles underlying the relationship between EU and China. And, and then, of course, we, the, the frustrations continue uh, until the point when in March uh, 2019, uh, the EU become even more explicit in naming China as a systemic rival uh, in the EU-China uh, strategic outlook uh, document. Yeah. So this is just to provide that backdrop to what EU uh, Asia policy has, how it has developed the focus on China, and of course then the uh, increasing competition uh, that that is seen. And then the next part of my paper look at ASEM in EU's Asia strategy. As I said, uh, the first, the first uh, response of uh, e EU to, to the idea of ASEM is a geoeconomic response, right? We need to respond to this possible idea that there's going to be an Asia Pacific uh, free trade area. So we need to have a link uh, with Asia so that we are not left out in this game, in this uh, uh, economic game. Um, but I also feel that uh, besides this narrative, this geo-economic narrative, ASEM actually offered the EU uh, its first real foray into, an identi ident into building its identity as an actor in uh, foreign and security policy. We know that uh, the, the CFSP as a pillar of the, of, of the EU only began with the signing of the, the when the uh, treaty, master, master Treaty came into force in 1993. So in that sense, the EU is searching for a role uh, you know, in defining itself, what kind of uh, foreign policy or security actor it should be. And I think ASEM offered that uh, uh, platform because it's one of those where the, where, and, and in the paper I look at how uh, the EU institutions, in particular the, the uh, external uh, 
uh, relations, initially the external relations, and after the Lisbon Treaty become the external action service, EEAS. The EU institutions has been the most uh, permanent coordinator in that sense of the, of the whole process because the ASM process operates in such a way, it doesn't have a secretariat, it doesn't have a formal secretariat. So the uh, coordination of the whole ASM process relies on uh, two coordinators from the European side and two from uh, Southeast, from, from Asia. And, and Asia, as you know, when ASM grows to become such a big diversified uh, uh, where it's not just the East Asia, but include members from Central Asia, South Asia, uh, and even uh, Russia and, and, and Australia and New Zealand comes under the Asian uh, pillar, then you have uh, difficulties for the, in, in that sense, there's these difficulties in coordinating and in the continuity. So the only one that really have the so-called institutional memory and have the and have all the information and able to then shape the agenda is really uh, the EU institutions uh, in, in ASEAN. And you could see them playing a very, uh, a much more uh, uh, proactive role when it comes to shaping the agenda in ASEM. And, and that could be seen in the way how the connectivity agenda in ASEM uh, developed. And my paper uh, show uh, after this the part on the evolution of the connectivity agenda uh, in ASM, how they try to uh, uh, push back and reshape the, the Chinese push towards the, or reshape the, it was uh, initially the Chinese who, who, who pushed for this connectivity agenda because of its BRI, but then how this was reshaped and reframed uh, in a different narrative by, by the EU through this sustainable connectivity uh, that they come up with emphasizing uh, multilateral, mu emphasizing rules, sustainability, and all that. So, um, and so I went through the how this uh, connectivity agenda uh, has evolved uh, in the uh, in the ASEM process, and 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 show that the EU has actually taken a very much proactive role in shaping the narrative of uh, connectivity in ASEM. Uh, and the last part, which, which is the most, to me, the most interesting part, but also where is, I, have, I have still to develop it further, is how the EU can make the most uh, out of this politicized connectivity uh, that we talk about. How uh, uh, both cooperation and competition uh, can proceed together in order to uh, achieve, so uh, to achieve a, a real uh, so-called win-win uh, uh, scenario, a win win outcome and not a zero sum, uh, uh, um, and not to have this zero sum mentality. So, I think my main conclusion for this is that I think the EU can be an important actor in shaping the connectivity agenda and must really uh, seize the initiative uh, to ensure this uh, best outcome uh, for all uh, through utilizing the ASM. A platform in, in uh, getting uh, the best outcome. So I think I will stop there. Thank you, Levy. Uh, very interesting paper. And uh, colleagues, friends, um, let's have uh, some exchange and discussion about uh, her paper so that uh, she can have a better idea to uh, write to complete the paper writing. Uh, do you have any comments, Anna, please? Um, yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much for your paper, Lewi. Uh, I have a, a question about uh, AS, uh, ASEAN, because you, you here you, you concentrate very much on a ASEM, but uh, the EU has tried to promote the con connectivity agenda also for ASEAN with much more, I think, um, let's say, uh, <laughs> varied uh, um, effects. So I just wondered, uh, is, what, what's the difference in approach, uh, both on behalf of the EU towards these two organizations, and what is the, uh, the sort of the, the response by, by these two organizations towards the EU's, uh, let's say, um, forays into connectivity in Asia? I think in, in this, in fact, the 23rd uh, Asia, uh, ASEAN EU ministerial meeting just took place yesterday. 
and they have uh, decided finally to, or agree finally to upgrade the relationship between EU ASEAN to a strategic partnership. So this is a, uh, a sign again that uh, within this context of the geopolitics, uh, the EU has starts to, uh, or EU recognizes the important uh, role that uh, ASEAN can play in the geopolitics of the region. And so they have started engaging and they also talk about that they should be partners in connectivity. Again, this is where I think uh, both the EU, in, because I'll talk about the EU in this case and not ASEAN. So my paper is focused on EUs, but the EU will again use this as an, as an additional uh, mechanism for it to shape the agenda because it's now uh, working also with ASEAN to talk about uh, you know, sustainable connectivity. So I think through all these various uh, ways, uh, EU is becoming quite, and to me, quite a significant player in the geopol geopolitics of connectivity. Hello, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Leo. Um, um, yeah, yesterday's uh, yesterday's uh, ministerial meeting uh, finally it happened, as you said, and they also uh, came with the uh, activity, right? A ministerial statement on connectivity. Um, ASEAN uh, is, a, is a relevant actor here, sure. But I was, I'm, I'm thinking about the intra asem uh, uh, competition or contestations. Um, that is to say, um, what about China and, um, and India here? Uh, and uh, in how far does uh, the EU's role, um, which you called uh, pretty be proactive, which you, um, in, in how far is it is it hampered, compromised uh, by by China, especially China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which was the wasn't it that the BRI? Uh, I mean, the BRI was there first, and and the EU reacted, so it was a. Until now, it's 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 more a reactive pattern that we see, and the question isn't the question whether this can be overcome and whether the EU actually becomes a more proactive actor here, and is ASEM institutionally uh, well um, disadvantaged because of of this uh, of the of the intra ASEM geopolitics, you know, I mean, India, China, ASEAN, all this discussion with the enlargement and and and, and India have and I mean, you know all that. So, what is your take here? I actually see the precisely the very fact that because ASEM has so many uh, different players that are all jumping into the connectivity agenda, right? You have Japan with the uh, India with this uh, Japan India and all that and this is where the the real geopolitics of connectivity will take place because you have so many players uh, involved and mm -hmm. of course again we have to be uh, uh, we are we know that ASEM is not a place where the real concrete projects will take place but it is a place to shape the narrative of what uh, how this connectivity should be the rules right the rules on sustainability the standards and all that and I think this is where uh, the EU, as a regulatory power, would have that, uh, the, that, that capacity. And, the, and now that they have the political will to try and shape at least some sort of rules governing all these connectivity projects and agenda. So I think this is where I, I really think, again, it's not where the concrete building of the projects or the railways are going to take place. But this is where the shaping of the rules, the setting of the standards, and all that uh, uh, can 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 can. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, yeah, uh, Levy, I, I enjoyed uh, reading your paper, and, and it, it, it was well, it has well summarized the the, the evolution, emergence of the connectivity, and also this discussion uh, on on the ASEAN. Uh, region, but uh, but I I, I was a, 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 well so, so, so it, it has a very nice the, uh, the content, but I was just thinking that uh, 
I was curious, what, what is the main message? Okay, so I, I tried to figure out the core message. Well, it, it, it has touched upon, well, this paper in, in a sense is, is in, it's a kind of big introductory the, uh, the chapter that uh, bring the issue of, of connectivity. So it deals with, with a number of issues, but as, 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 as a comprehensive pillar, somehow it focused too much on the ASEM and ASEAN. And, uh, and also I thought that maybe uh, this, what, what so it, uh, I, I hoped that uh, it would have been more kind of persuasive if, if we can uh, argue that connectivity, the uh, initiative from the European Union side, uh, would would whether and and it, it would make a difference, make a difference vis-a-vis -vis the, the existing trading scheme, existing investment, and existing partnership and, and strategic partnership. There are multiple levels already pretty tight, and and what the, the European Union and, and Asia can make a real substantial difference with, with this uh, the uh, connectivity initiative Other, otherwise it will be just just kind of the uh, kind, kind of wording referring any kind of relations and, and it, it actually has highlighted the, uh, the transportation energy digital and people to people uh, re relation a, a, as a four major pillars so uh, I, I was wondering whether you know that uh, Kind of structure can be combined, and and also I I w w was wondering whether it would be a good idea to uh, to bring ASEM on the one side and ASEAN on the other side because we the uh, connectivities are dealing with Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and and East Asia. So at least there are four kind of different uh, regions, and and uh, so the uh, well. And, and and you are mentioning ASEM also, so I'm I I was a, a little bit kind of the, the wondering the, around the, this the, the ASEM part and and ASEAN part. So uh, I was curious how what what was your kind of major focus? I'm cognizant of the fact that I as far as I remember when we uh, flesh out this. Um, uh, series for the book and for the special uh, journal or some special issue of the journal, there's going to be a separate paper on ASEAN. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I will be also writing it. So that's why I do uh -huh. not know. I'm focusing here really on the role of the EU and mm -hmm. looking at how it shaped the narratives of the, mm -hmm. uh, the, geopol uh, the uh -huh. connectivity agenda and not going into the specifics again of the more concrete uh -huh. yeah. Uh, uh, say, okay, uh, uh, you know, uh, is EU really going to, to invest in all these infrastructure projects on, uh, say, uh, uh, to mitigate climate? Because I think there will be individual chapters uh, dealing with those. So my paper should be in that sense, look at this very broad overarching paper, focusing on the shaping of narratives. And this is where the big broad, so-called the big geopolitics, the, 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 you know, uh, takes place, right? Who shape the narratives and, the, and but not looking into the various, the, the real, uh, what are they going to do, invest in, in Asia or in ASEAN or in, in Central Asia, in the energy pipelines or whatever, to counter, for instance, to, to counter the, uh, those uh, that are being uh, put in place, say, by the China. So, so, so I think, I hope uh, that explains why my paper is so broad in that sense. And uh, as far as I remember, uh, the paper to be presented uh, tomorrow by Sebastian is uh, dealing with uh, a little bit conceptual framework of uh, this uh, connectivity issue because uh, he has the title EU Asia Connectivity Concepts, Contexts and Contestations. And uh, having uh, put, uh, putting this uh, paper uh, as the lead article before, uh, I mean, after my introductory article, uh, then uh, we can have uh, some more specified papers on, uh, for instance, uh, lady writing about uh, uh, EU's 
uh, strategy, right, uh, of uh, connectivity, especially focusing on ASEM. And uh, uh, Anna is uh, reporting to us about uh, the um, EU's role in the world, uh, uh, how to promote uh, EU's role in the world uh, through the connectivity uh, strategy and so on. So I think that uh, the focus is uh, not uh, uh, bad. I have, uh, if you have uh, no further comments or questions, I have uh, one or two uh, comments and questions to Ravi. Uh, one is, uh, you have discussed the uh, secretariat issue of ASEM, right? <clears throat> and uh, I had the impression that the discussion is a little bit too lengthy. Uh, secretariat issue, uh, institutionalization of ISM is important, but uh, whether we have to have uh, one page uh, uh, for discussing the secretariat issue, that was my uh, question. Um, and another uh, comment uh, I have is, uh, uh, I totally agree with you that uh, the beginning of 1990s was uh, the start of uh, EU's uh, new policy and strategy uh, towards Asia. And uh, I pretty much was thinking that uh, and in that period, not only the European Union, but also US was paying uh, quite big attention, great attention to uh, Asia. Uh, because uh, we know that the uh, United States has uh, adopted the, the big emerging markets initiative and uh, probably you can add one sentence or two uh, into that uh, paragraph on page two. Uh, and then uh, my major question to you is, um, when we look at the EU's approach towards Asia, um, as you mentioned in your paper, uh, the, uh, for quite a while, uh, the EU strategy towards Asia was uh, pretty much preoccupied by China strategy, right? And how uh, the EU differentiates between Asia strategy and China strategy now uh, in the current context, uh, there is one uh, fundamental kind of question uh, probably you have to answer in discussing this, right? And another thing is, uh, because you are focusing on EU strategy uh, about connectivity with Asian countries, uh, probably you can bring into discussion uh, how the EU is approaching this with individual Asian countries. Because we know that Japan already signed a MOU with the EU on the cooperation on connectivity uh, projects. And uh, the other day I was talking with uh, EU ambassador of, in Korea. And uh, she said, uh, uh, we have got new ambassador now. And uh, she said uh, that Korean government has approached it to the EU uh, delegation as well to discuss about the uh, MOU, right? So to cooperate uh, with the uh, uh, European Union on connectivity project. So how the European Union uh, plays the game and uh, because uh, we know that uh, the uh, EU Asia Connect Europe Asia Connectivity uh, Initiative is uh, certainly kind of competitor to BRI of China, uh, but also uh, it has some potential to for cooperation as well, right? Uh, so how uh, this uh, cooperation and competition would uh, played uh, would be played out by? Uh, China on the one end and by the European Union on the other. So that's uh, my comments and question at the same time. Uh, on the secretary issue, yes, it could be uh, shortened, but I do think it's an important part because it's precisely because of this secretary issue that the EU could have such a big hold, if I may that's use the term, on ASEAN. Mm -hmm. Because there's no secretariat, that's why the EU could shape the agenda and shape the direction of ASEM, right? Mm -hmm. That's why, in that sense, why I put that much. But you could, of course, doesn't. Then, uh, 
I take the comment that I should add something about U.S. attention and elaborate a little bit on, on that. that. That one, I can, can do it. On your last question, which is very important, I think, and, and as I say, it's both a comment, and I, I, I do take that, as I said, uh, the part, the last part that I do about the competition, you know, the, the, the competition and making the most of the politicized connectivity competition and cooperation. And I think I do have to bring in a bit more on how these other uh, uh, connectivity agendas uh, that, the Jap that the EU have with Japan <coughs> and now maybe Korea one I have not heard, but I will look into that, will, uh, will, will play out in that sense. And of course, also the, the, this, the starting of the discussion about uh, with ASEAN on being uh, partners in connectivity. So I would look into that and, and uh, add it into the, into the last. Thank you. So, friends, do you have uh, further questions or comments? If not, uh, we can proceed with uh, the paper. I mean, uh, uh, probably we can 